your Bibles back to Matthew chapter 7, carrying on in our expository study of Matthew's gospel and reaching the conclusion now of our Lord's magnificent and rightly most famous of all his sermons, the Sermon on the Mount. Remember from last week, he turns a corner, he heads for the finish line, he is reaching a climax and a crescendo, he's calling for a decision, he's put the fork in the road, he's been unmasking false assurance, he has been pointing the way to true assurance so that you and I can not be self-deceived about our eternal destiny so that we can be sure if we are on the narrow way that leads to life and not on the broad road to eternal destruction. But here we are, a title this morning for Matthew 7, verse 15 through 20 is Wolves in the Pulpit. Wolves in the Pulpit. We sit here on Palm Sunday, start of Passion Week, Christianity's holiest week of the year. Joining us will be 1.2 billion Roman Catholics celebrating around the world, convinced that they are Christians. How many Roman Catholics do you know? that have been taught the true gospel of salvation and understand justification by faith. Sadly, very few. 260 million Orthodox believers will celebrate this week around the world, Greek, Russian, Serbian, Ethiopian, Coptic, and so forth. How many do you know that have any grasp of the biblical gospel? 644 million is the estimate of today's Pentecostal charismatic movement, and as high as 80 to 90 percent now follow the health, wealth, prosperity heresy, which sends people to hell because it lies about true salvation. Nine million Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide today believing in a false Christ because of the teaching of a false prophet, Charles Russell, some 150 years ago. 16 million Mormons currently on the broad road to eternal destruction because of a false prophet, Joseph Smith, teaching them a false Christ. 200 to 300 million Zionist African independent churches here on this continent thinking they are saved. You and I, once more, as with some of these other groups, know people like that. Some of you have come out of movements like that. And we know how extremely rare it is, how very few of them understand Christ's way of salvation. Almost all of these in the Zionist groups who will gather by the millions in the coming days believe in a kind of syncretistic, cultural, ancestral, false gospel. Add to that how many millions in mainline dead Protestant churches that have apostatized decades ago from the true gospel. Anglicans, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Methodists, Dutch Reformed and so forth. And then worst of all, and the hardest of all, is for us to admit in our own midst, right? Biblical, Protestant, evangelical churches, Baptistic, Reformed churches like ours, families like yours and mine, preaching the true gospel, even defending the true gospel. And yet, there are those who are self-deceived, those who have false assurance, what the Gospel of John describes as unsaved believers, what the Puritans called, especially in times of revival, the risk of temporary converts who don't endure to the end. What is probably the most haunting word in Matthew 7 that appears more than once? We saw it last week in verse 13. It starts with an M, ends with a Y. The word many. Not some, not few, not just a lot. But many will enter the broad road, verse 13 warns us. Verse 22 will warn the same. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons? And third time, in your name. These are very religious, churched, Christianized people. Yet lost and condemned. Matthew 24, Jesus goes on to teach As he prepares us for his return, 
And four times over we hear this same refrain. Many will fall away. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Beloved, it poses and forces a question for us. What are we to make of this 2,000 year checkered history of Christianity? (laughs) This very mixed legacy of the professing Christian church. The scoffers and the skeptics love to seize this occasion, don't they? And turn it against us and say, this is why we reject your faith. I mean, I I thought your Jesus promised to build his church. What kind of building is this? All your endless divisions and fragmentation and splintering and splitting. I mean, if Jesus rose again and the Bible is true, why is Christianity, the, the story of Christianity so messy? I mean, why can't you guys sort out your own problems? All the friendly fire and infighting and you're all reading the same book after all. And if the church is Christ's body on earth, the critic says, why is there so much heresy and hypocrisy and scandal? What kind of body is this? If all those other so-called Christian groups that I just listed are all wrong, what makes you right? You have a corner on the truth? How terribly arrogant that sounds. Do we not sing, though with a scornful wonder men see her sore oppressed by schisms rent asunder, by heresy distressed? It's in times like this, brethren, we, face, we praise God when we turn to texts like Matthew 7. We are thankful for passages like this that keep us from confusion or despair, that prevent us from giving up on the Christian faith. Or going astray from it. And in fact, many texts in scripture like this that equip us to discern church history and modern trends. And to understand enough of what's going on to stand firm. Often in scripture, the Lord gives us this absolute standard. This infallible criteria of truth by which to judge all that claims to be true. And to recognize error. Not on our own authority. Not because of any merit of our own. But by his grace alone. By his spirit alone, through his word. I love the way that 1 John also describes it in 1 John chapter 2. Where he tells us about our full insurance coverage. Our complete protection against all the deceivers and liars that will infiltrate and threaten the church in every age. He says, you have two things and it's all you need. You have the abiding word and you have the anointing Holy Spirit. You know the truth. You heard it in the beginning. Let that word abide and remain in you. Don't let go of it. And you have the anointing spirit. He teaches you. You're not at the mercy of the latest fads and bandwagons. You have the anointing spirit. You have the abiding word. And so when we come to Matthew 7, we are prepared by Jesus. It's it's like he wrote the script of church history. Uh, Not to mention next time when we come to verses 21 to 23. He spelled out the modern last hundred years of the Pentecostal charismatic movement. Almost in exact detail. It's like act one, act two, act three. Oh yeah, exactly what Jesus said would unfold. Lest we be shaken. Lest we be startled and disillusioned by this. We ought to expect that the Christian landscape would be littered with drama and damage, wreckage and ruin until Christ returns. We know in part, after all scripture says. We grieve over this, but we're not surprised by it. Did Paul not say to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 11? I hear that divisions exist among you. In part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you. So that those who are approved may become evident among you. You'll know them by their fruit, as we're about to read. Expect counterfeits and pretenders mixed in among the genuine. Lots of tares among the wheat, as Jesus teaches elsewhere. Lots of wolves disguised as sheep. We come to our text in Matthew 7 from verse 15 through 20. Please stand as we read our passage this morning. Follow along as I read. Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets. Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. 
Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Father, thank you that in your love and mercy you warn us and prepare us. As your word tells us, love does not delight in evil or unrighteousness, but it rejoices in the truth. The nature of love is to warn us to abstain from what is evil, to cling to what is good. We think of Paul's prayer for the Philippians. And we too pray that our love would abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Teach us now, we pray, O Lord. Save those who are lost and duped and captive to any number of errors that have ravaged the church in our day and have built ministries all around us with damning lies and false prophecies and fake miracles. Oh Lord, only by your grace do we know better. Are we in any different situation or churches? Humble us, alert us, arm us, equip us, oh Lord, by your spirit, through your word. For Christ's sake we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. Wolves in the pulpit. The first question you ought to be asking at this point, if you were here last week or even if you weren't, is what's the connection, Tim, with the previous two verses, 13 and 14? How do the two gates and the two roads relate to the two trees? Huh? It's probably not that difficult, is it? It ought to be obvious. Standing at the two gates we saw last week and pointing to the narrow or the broad road are guides, leaders, voices, teachers, prophets. Kind of like when your plane has landed and you arrive at an airport, especially in a foreign country, and if you don't know where your car is or who's going to pick you up, especially in some Middle Eastern areas I've found, within seconds, if you hesitate, you will be bombarded and surrounded by a thousand taxi drivers. Hey, 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 you, 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 you. Because <laughs> you're not sure. Ah, and they will guide you for a nice price for you. <laughs> Beware of picking the wrong driver, listening to the wrong guide, following the wrong leader. Notice it's not a question of if you and I have spiritual leaders and teachers in life. If, if we're not, there's not a question of if there are influential voices disciples and mentors. No, it's only which voices and which teachers and leaders will influence you most. And so we come to verses 15 through 20. We're going to look this morning, beloved, at two keys. Two keys to avoid deception. Two keys to avoid deception, to not be duped, to stay on the straight and narrow and not fall into the broad and destructive path. The first key is a warning, verse 15. And then more briefly, we'll look at watching, verses 16 through 20. Warning and then watching. First of all, verse 15, warning against wolves. Notice the biblical tension here. Remember that Matthew 7 begins with five verses about not taking the speck out of your brother's eye if you haven't first. Taken the log out of your own eye. Beware of wrong judgmentalism, ungodly criticism is forbidden. And yet, as we already saw in verse 6, there are dogs and there are pigs. Don't cast your pearls before swine. And so now we see further there is a call for right judging, for biblical discerning, for Christian discriminating between truth and error. Look at the command there in verse 15. Beware. It's a present tense imperative. An ongoing threat is assumed. Constant vigilance is required. Unceasing watchfulness. Tireless teaching. Exposing error. Instruction in truth. Teaching between the difference between good and bad doctrine. As we say in theology, we are not yet the church triumphant in glory. We are still the church militant on this fallen earth. We haven't left the battlefield yet. The groom hasn't come to fetch his bride. Our captain hasn't called or come for us yet. We're still under siege. The warfare rages on. Jesus is saying here, never let down your guard against error. Never become spiritually drunk or drowsy as the New Testament often warns. And as elders and pastors are required to be temperate and sober-minded. And So here Jesus calls for all 
believers to have a clear-headed discernment. Stay on the alert, red alert against all the foes of our faith, against every threat against the truth from within and from without. And especially, what does it say? Beware of false prophets. Jesus assumes what is shocking to our postmodern relativistic world, that absolute truth exists, that you can know what it is, and that you should measure all things by it. There is a definite biblical standard to determine the true from the false. In every age, there's going to be those who claim to speak for God, right? They claim to be his mouthpieces. What do you think they're going to do? Come in Satan's name? That's not likely. That isn't good for business. <laughs> in most cultures, at least. No, they're going to claim to be the Lord's messengers and his mouthpiece. Again, the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, preparing for the increasing birth pangs before Christ returns. There won't be a decrease of false prophets who mislead many. There will be an increase. Impostors will abound. Hypocrites will be rife. Guaranteed. And the Old Testament is filled with the same warnings. It's nothing new about what Jesus is saying here. In Deuteronomy, we won't turn there, but make note of this. In Deuteronomy 13 and 18, two key chapters that give us two tests for identifying false prophets. There's a doctrine test and a proof test. Deuteronomy 13 is the doctrine test. Is what the guy says biblical? Listen to Deuteronomy 13. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or wonder, are you ready for this? And the sign or wonder comes true. <laughs> he did a miracle. He does have supernatural powers. Yeah, just like Pharaoh's magicians. The Jews knew that. There's other powers at play. Not only God's power. Deuteronomy 13 continues. And the, the miracle comes true, which he spoke to you, saying, so here's the message that he has with his miracle. Let us go after other gods whom you have not known. Let us serve them, false gods, idols. The Lord says, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Yes, it's a prophet in your midst. He's a false prophet because God is testing you because he loves you. He wants to see if you love him fully. Don't be fooled. So there's the doctrine test. Is their message biblical, regardless of their supernatural powers? And then there's the proof test, and that's over in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Listen to Deuteronomy 18. The prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, notice the Lord says, doesn't matter, pagan god or a so-called Christian god. Here's the test. That prophet shall die. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? Does that not sound like the spiritual landscape today, everywhere we look, people are, or they ought to be asking, and I know many sincere people who have come to a church like this are with broken hearts and tear-filled eyes. They're saying, how do I know the difference? Who do I listen to? Everyone sends me a video, a podcast, a song, or whatever. They all claim to be right. They all quote from the Bible. Who do I listen to? Deuteronomy 18 when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come true, then the Lord has not spoken. That's not complicated. As they say t in Tennessee, this isn't rocket surgery. <laughs> if it doesn't happen, they're a liar. And yet this idea of fallible prophets, even from leading evangelical theologians, is overwhelmingly popular in the Christian church today. A few years back, I believe it was in Pretoria, a leading South African so-called prophet was Ed Trout. Some of you may recognize the name, Ed Trout, founder of Prophetic Voice Ministries. He wrote a book called The Truth About Prophecy. I quote, someone who makes a mistake or what seems to be a mistake is not a false prophet. He's either not a prophet or he's a very inexperienced one, but definitely not a false one. Run that by me one more time. So he gets a free pass on error. He's exempt from any biblical rebuke or condemnation because why? Based on what scripture? Oh, he's just an inexperienced liar. But he's not a false prophet. 
Where does scripture ever make that allowance or concession? On the contrary, it says the opposite as we've just read. Beware of false prophets. But there is such a tolerant, worldly, politically correct climate in the church today that has been catastrophic. Have you noticed the only people that they will not tolerate is the one who exposes error and points out the false prophet. Get rid of that guy. Oh, hold on. But he loves us. He's the one warning us. Have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? Paul said to the Galatians. You troubler of Israel, said Ahab to Elijah. Why is there always a market for false prophets? Think about it. Because we're born loving lies. No one naturally loves the truth. Romans chapter 3, none righteous, none who does good, not even one. They keep deceiving with their tongues. No fear of God before their eyes. We're born loving darkness, not light, right? John chapter 3, we're born hating God and his truth. We're born as children of Satan, the deceiver, the father of lies. We're captive to lies until the Lord makes us new, until the truth sets you free, as Jesus says. Then you'll be free indeed. Until then... We are prone to lies. Listen to a few other Old Testament warnings. By the way, seminary student asked a good question this week. You don't have to write down every cross-reference I give you if you feel it prevents you from engaging with the preacher. I know I have a face for radio. But if you are worried, we have email. It's a modern invention, super amazing. And uh, you can get that from Dom or us anytime you want the sermon manuscript. Listen to these in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 5. A horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their own means and their own authority. Jeremiah chapter 14. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, nor did I speak unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination, and a thing of naught and deceit of their heart. Notice, false prophets are not God appointed, they're not heaven sent. They are man-made, they are self-appointed, and often Satan-sent, and hell-authorized. They speak with the forked tongue and the hiss of the serpent. Jeremiah 23, go and read a whole chapter warning against false prophets, and what's their favorite segue, what's their telltale signature, and their guaranteed intro to gain a hearing, to get a book, to go viral with their videos and TikTok feed and their podcasts. The Lord told me. God said to me. Jeremiah 23. I have seen also the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery. They walk in lies. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets that prophesy to you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. Can I just point out, beloved? I was going to say this later, but... We live in such a hyper-connected, hyper-information age. We think we have a right to read and listen to everything. Says who? There is slander going around in every age against godly leaders. And Christians think, I've got to read it. I've got to taste all the smuck and poison. Really? False prophets. Oh, I need to know. Seminary. So oh, we need to expose you to all the views. Oh, let's have interfaith dialogue and ecumenical discussion and religious uh, fascinating dialogue. Where do you get that from the Bible? Jesus says, beware. Jeremiah says, stop it. Romans says, avoid. Scripture says, watch out. Where do we get this arrogant, intellectual, self-confident myth that says, I must engage with all the poison I can without it poisoning me. I have this incredible immunity that I have uh, internally devised because of my brilliant... (sighs) Listen to yourself. Why did the nation of Israel fall and get sent away into 70 years of exile? Because they listened to false prophets. One of the main reasons the Lord judged them. They tolerated the Balaams in their midst. Instead of staying vigilant, warning and rebuking them. Last week, the fair-haired girl of evangelicalism. Gospel Coalition placards and parades her almost daily. Raise your hand if you've heard of Jackie Hill Perry. Hip-hop artist, that helps. Female Christian writer, speaker, done a lot of good things. 
happens to announce in a lengthy series of tweets last week, I'm embracing the prophetic. And you need to know that for years, God has primarily dealt with me through dreams. My best dreams are after I have too much pizza. <laughs> Instead of God's words, this woman now tells us dreams is where the real action is at. What a red flag. What a dangerous drift. Can I just point out, by the way, now that we have a completed canon of Scripture, as I preached a couple of weeks ago, Ephesians 2.20, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, if that's been laid, and you have a cessationist view, as is taught in this church, that those unique, apostolic, revelatory gifts are no longer necessary in the church today, you have a great safeguard against error. But many of these charismatic and continuationist, excuse me, brothers who believe that these gifts continue to function, leave themselves wide open to this kind of wacky nonsense and these kind of foolish dreamers. I don't care if she can put her dreams to a clever rhyme and a catchy beat. That will only spread the poison quicker. As cessationists, this is, you know, there's a lot of challenging things in theology in the Bible. I'm, I'm afraid this is not one of them. If someone today claims to be a prophet, wrong, out of hand, dismissed, false. There are no prophets. <laughs> if you want to make sure you don't ever get guilty and condemned by God or the church for false prophecy, easy solution, don't prophesy. <laughs> You'll never be guilty of false prophecy if you never claim to prophesy. Next question. How clear, how safe, how secure the word of God, how, what a firm standing it gives to us. If only we would submit ourselves to it. Beware of false prophets. 1 John 4 comes to mind. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Oh sure, they say they heard a voice. They minister in the supernatural. They're led by the spirit. But which spirit? Is the question, right? How do you know it's not a demonic spirit instead of the Holy Spirit of God? Notice here in this first key, this first point, warning against wolves. There's two reasons that Jesus gives us. Two reasons in verse 15. Because the wolves are deceptive and they are destructive. Notice they are deceptive and they are destructive. We've already seen that they're false, but it's worse, far worse than that. They come in sheep's clothing. I mean, what did you expect? Were they going to wear a neon sign with flashing lights that says, I'm a wolf, I'm a wolf, let's all sing, wolf, wolf, wolf. <laughs> of course not. They're going to look like Christians, sound like children of God, behave for a while like innocent sheep, saved, harmless as the most harmless of animals. Big talkers, lots of Bible verses, all the right lingo. You think of Bethel music. Some of the songs are fine and doctrinally harmless. And they hook you in and soon you're in the cult bound for Hades. Oh, but it's a big cowboy hat and it's jeans and it's farmer language and it's down-home talk and it's fix your marriage and live a good life and love Jesus how harmless could you be? This guy couldn't hurt a flea. They're chivalrous. They're polite. They're mannerly. They're virtuous. And in some cases, sincere and pleasant, winsome and charming. And by the way, unlike these expository verse-by-verse -verse sermons and doctrine and theology, they just inspire. They motivate. They've got a Joel Osteen smile. The Joyce Meyer you know, voice, I think that, that might be a red flag already, but it's, it's not always that obvious. Husky isn't always helpful. Joel James says, the Sioux, the Sioux Indians of the Great Plains of North America, before they acquired horses, used to hunt the American buffalo in a similar way. If they approached a buffalo herd directly, the herd would just move out of range. Their spears and the arrows, buffaloes aren't dumb. And so the hunters these Indians would wrap themselves in the skin of an animal that the buffalo did not fear. And the most common buck, the antelope at the time, was the pronghorn antelopes. And so they would take the skin 
and they would edge closer and closer to the unsuspecting buffalo herd. And then they'd throw off the antelope skin and spear a surprised buffalo cow or calf straight through the heart. 2 Corinthians 11, Satan comes masquerading as an angel of no horns, no pitchfork, not slimy or husky voice. No, 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 you're not angel of light. Jude 4, for certain persons have crept. They didn't march, they didn't barge, they didn't storm in. They crept in unnoticed. Woe to them. They are hidden reefs at your love feast, Jude says. Second Peter 2, false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly, not publicly, not openly, subtly introduce destructive heresies. In Romans 16, verse 18, by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Did you see the news last week? One of the fastest growing churches in our day, a 40-year ministry, the man who founded and led Hillsong Church, Brian Houston, resigned over investigations about sexually inappropriate and drunken behavior. Hillsong claims 130,000 members in 30 countries around the world, including 15 different churches here in SA. Their biggest influence has been through their worship music, which has taken the world by storm. And yet, if Christians had been alert, if Christian leaders and uh, pastors had been warning, people would have ditched and bolted and forsaken Hillsong decades ago. Brian's wife was an ordained pastor, first red flag, preaching in the pulpit. They have openly espoused word faith heresy. They have continued to capitulate to the gay and LGBTQ agenda. They have had numerous moral scandals in their top leadership. They have continued to spread this worldly, pragmatic model of numbers-based church growth around the globe. Beware of false prophets, wolves in sheep's clothing. They're deceptive, but notice also they are destructive under this first point. Look at the text. They are inwardly ravenous wolves. The Greek word for snatching or seizing their prey. Savage is the idea. Bloodthirsty, insatiable appetite. Strong jaws, sharp teeth hidden behind that handsome smile. Shrewd cunning, sneaky strategies so that they can pounce on their prey. When it's too late. Ezekiel chapter 22. The prophet Ezekiel warned. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in your midst. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. Romans 16 verse 17. Now I urge you brethren. Watch out for those who cause dissensions and hindrances. Contrary to the teaching you learned. And turn away from them and avoid them. 2 Timothy chapter 2, repeatedly, Paul warns that false teaching spreads like gangrene. Have you seen what gangrene does to a limb, to the physical body, how much more to the eternal souls of people? Paul goes on in 2 Timothy 2 to say these false teachings lead to the ruin of their hearers. It upsets the faith of some. No wonder Paul's famous and moving farewell sermon to his beloved Ephesian elders in a church he had planted and poured almost three years of his life into. He says in Acts chapter 20, using the language of Ezekiel chapter 33, of a watchman on the wall. He says, I testify you to this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Do you hear the heart of the apostle? He's saying, I may not have said what you wanted to hear, but I told you what you needed to hear. I'd rather you hate me in this life for the truth than curse me in the next life because I withheld it from you. Paul goes on to say, I didn't shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God purchased by his own blood. I know, he says, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves, not out there, not wacko, not Jim Jones and uh, all kinds of crazy heretics that have done enough damage in your midst, sitting next to you this morning in the pew. Men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, he says. 
Remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. One of my biggest fears as a pastor and elder, not that I'm that old, but I've seen this happen too many times. You reach your latter years, if you've stayed faithful, if you haven't blown it, and you've still got a marriage, and you've got a family, and you have a ministry, you want to coast. You've done a bit of this, you've done a bit of that, you haven't ruined it all, and so you just want to sit back, I'm tired. You start to plan your retirement, you start to think of a break. Unlike the few, the faithful shepherds that are still in their 80s, I love that interview recently where someone said to Dr. MacArthur, how do you pick the battles? And there are a lot of younger men in ministry that pick the wrong battles. I get, I get, the, I get the point, but he went, he went beyond that to the bigger question. And because the question was, you know, major attacks on the truth, defending the gospel. Which battles do you fight? He said, all of them. All of them. If the truth is at stake, we don't pick the battles. The battle picked us. Will we stand or will we fall? It's not about me and my comfort and my preference. It's about the precious flock, the sheep of God. God help us as churches, the whole membership, especially our leaders, are to be like this hunter in a wolf-infested forest in the night, taking the light of Scripture and exposing all the glowing eyes of the predators lurking in the shadows, waiting in the wings, you will be their next victim if you don't beware. We don't tolerate them. We don't stay open-minded. We're not afraid to be narrow. It's not about offending or hurting their feelings, respecting their opinions, engaging in dialogue. We don't believe the 11th commandment says thou shalt be nice. We are told to beware of false prophets. We've been looking at this on Tuesday nights. All of you are welcome. It was great to have six or seven folk from Antioch in theology class last Tuesday. We're here from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. You can come anytime. And we're looking at Christology, the doctrine of Christ, the very belief that was bombarded for the first 300 years or more of the church. Because Satan knew, if I can confuse you about who Jesus is and how he was both God and man in one person, I've got you. Christ is the cornerstone of your faith and all the other heresies will flow from that. Praise God for the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed and the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed that followed and the Chalcedonian Creed, all to expose error, to confront false prophets and to defend truth. Why was there two Nicene Creeds, do you know? First one, Right after the Edict of Milan and Christianity became legal, many of the bishops and pastors had limbs lost and injuries. They had loved ones that were martyred for their faith. They rallied together and wrote the Nicene Creed in 325, only years that followed to depart from that very creed. And I'm told most, if not the majority, who wrote the Nicene Creed rejected it and became heretics because Arius was so charming, the original Jehovah's Witness denying that Jesus was eternal, uncreated. He wrote songs and catchy jingles and clever, fun, exciting churches. And the majority went with him until a North African pastor named Athanasius stood up and defended the truth and wrote a creed and helped rewrite the Niceno-Constantinopolitan creed, which all Christianity today, Protestant, Catholic, and even Orthodox, affirms as biblical. But Athanasius, at one point, he'd been exiled nine times out of his church and out of his city. He was so outnumbered. At one point, the authorities said, Athanasius, the whole world is against you. In other words, you idiot. How could you be right and everyone else be wrong? He says, if the whole world is against me, then Athanasius contra mundum. I am against the world. And we all owe our Christian faith to men like Athanasius, who said, beware of false prophets. Truth matters, and he stood. One other application, beloved, on this first point. Beware of trusting your intuition, your gut feel. Unless you're one of those rare souls who has decades of pastoral or spiritual leadership experience drenched in the scriptures, and even then, you wouldn't use this kind of language normally. But I'm alarmed at how many Christians will say, 
I just have a good sniffer. Oh, I can tell when it's air. I can tell when someone's creepy. I know what's right and what's wrong. I just, I just kind of feel it within. Beware. Proverbs says, you trust your own heart, you're a fool. Trust this book alone. Trust the careful study of this book. This is infallible, not you and me and my intuition and our sort of uh, subjective sense of the situation. It's not so easy. Wolves aren't that obvious. Fruit, as we're about to see, takes time to study and to examine before it is clear. We need a plurality of elders leading churches. None of us is omnicompetent. None of us is immune to deception. All of us need to learn more of the art of holy suspicion against error. Number two, we've seen warning against wolves. They're deceptive, they're destructive. Number two, watching for fruit. Watching for fruit, verses 16 through 20. Watching for fruit. Critics will remark, who appointed you the official fruit inspector? Who put you in charge of quality controls around here? Who enlisted you for performance reviews and outcome assessment and fruit examination? Well, thank you for asking. When it comes to spiritual leaders and which voices you should listen to for the salvation of your eternal, eternal soul and which is the wrong or the right way to heaven, we're not just allowed to examine fruits. We're required, the Bible says. King Jesus tells us, Right here, it's one of the laws of his kingdom. Look at verse 16. What does he say next? You will know them by their fruits. And he repeats it in verse 20. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Framing the entire passage. Showing how important these instructions are. Pointing out that this must be a major way that we watch out for false prophets. So it is not open season on God's sheep so that they're not gorging and plunging themselves into more and more precious souls that they will feed and feast upon. Here is a key strategy for wolf detection, for spotting spiritual intruders in our midst. Jesus says, examine their fruits. In other words, judge their words and their deeds. Look for the results in their life and their behavior. Analyze their doctrine and their life, their beliefs and their behavior. Have you ever seen a fruit tree bear fruit overnight? I know we have some avo farmers here this morning. Even non-farmers know it takes time. If it shows up overnight, then you know it's fake. <laughs> you wait until it's harvest time. You wait until they are in season. And so it is with both good and bad fruit. Don't miss the point Jesus is making here. There has to be careful analysis. It's going to take time to study. You could easily be tricked, just like you can get the narrow and the broad way mixed up, just like a wolf can look like a sheep for a while. So bad fruit can look, smell, shine, and sparkle for a while like good fruit. One test would be what we've seen in Deuteronomy 18, prophecies that don't come true. That would be failed fruit. There is bad fruit if ever there was any. Joel James again points out the comfort, the encouragement here. It's not a command like in verse 15 in the imperative. It's what we call the indicative. You will know. Again, verse 20, you will know. He says, as deceitful, smooth, and tricky as false teachers are, our Lord expected that his followers could and would be able to pick them out. The wolf cannot forever pretend to be grandma. Eventually, little Red Riding Hood will see his long nose, big ears, and sharp teeth, right? Keep reading, verse 16. You'll know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? <laughs> Useless thorns. How'd you like a breakfast of thistles? <laughs> How about a thorn omelet? Mmm. You're not going to get that from a juicy grapevine or a healthy fig tree, no matter what the genetic advances and latest agrarian technologies might be. It's impossible, right? And you wouldn't want to in the first place. And yet, Christians all the time tolerate spiritual thorns and theological thistles from ministries that claim God's name. Churches tolerate weeds and junk 
from preachers and musicians that claim to be Bible-believing, but they spread doctrinal poison and live unholy lives. Keep reading, verse 17. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree, verse 18, cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. It doesn't matter how official he or she sounds. Usually it's a dead giveaway, isn't it? The book or the, the sermon, if they have to throw in all their titles there. I get suspicious even if I'm visiting somewhere and people feel like they have to pile on or make up some titles for me as if there's not enough authority in the Word of God itself. Oh, Reverend, Doctor, Bishop, Apostle, Prophet, so and so. Doesn't matter how much fancy clothing, jewelry, glamorous wife, right? Cars, houses, airplanes, etc. As we're going to see down in verse 22, doesn't matter all the so called miracles, fake expelling of demons, flashy signs and wonders. Doesn't matter how impressive the crowds, how big the number is, how excellent the music. How nice the vibe and the lights and the stage and the show and the feeling of it all. Trust none of that, Jesus says. Never are these God's criteria for success. Look for one thing and one thing alone. Show me the fruit. Show me the fruit. And this word implies both their doctrine and their lives. The impact on their followers over time. The proof is in, finish the sentence, right? The pudding. The spiritual results, not numerical, not external, but godly fruit speaks loudest and longest. A kind of self-authenticating force that can't be denied or mistaken. Remember, the bad fruit's not obvious at first. It's only when you bite into it. We've all done this, haven't we? Oh, honey, look what I got at the store. A great deal on these discount watermelons. Ooh, they had a special on strawberries today. Oh, you should see these nectarines. How about these avos? They were half price. Ooh, yes, you pull out the knife, you reach for the strawberry, and busted. Eesh. What a disappointment. Never again. I'm going back to that store. Where's my refund? (laughs) Once you bite into it. That's why Jesus says here twice, you must know, recognize, Look, pay attention, beware, don't be fooled by the disguises that the fruit will attempt for a season. Galatians 5, the works of the flesh are evident, right? All of their fleshly and ugly and selfish harm and ruin. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Quoted a few times from Joel James. It's a free booklet I want to recommend to you. 42 pages, free online. It's a PDF. If you look up under his name, Joel James, and it's called Identifying False Teachers. Identifying False Teachers, a biblical checklist. He talks about their conduct and their character. If you want to learn to know them by their bad fruits, first of all, their conduct. He, he lists a few things. A lack of preaching against sin. 2 Timothy 4, the church of the itching ears, right? The church of the wide gate and the broad road. So often the case, isn't it? When someone turns out later to be a false teacher, but you, for a while, sometimes for years, you read their books, you listened to their sermons, you sang their songs, and you're like, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing blatantly unbiblical about it. But it's what they won't say, and it's what they won't refute, and what they won't stand against. And when the pressure comes from LGBTQ, and when the pressure comes from this or that side, and and, and when Matthew 18, church discipline should be applied to to, uh, uh, adultery or divorce or or, uh, uh, blatant sin in the church, they go quiet. They rub the, smooth out the rough edges of truth. It's what they don't say that may prove them in the end a false prophet. Play favorites with the rich. Curry favor with the powerful, the influential. Gradually, quietly improving your political correctness and your cultural acceptability. A lack of preaching against sin. Another deadly mark of their fruit in terms of their conduct is a deceptive claim to do miracles. As we see here in Matthew 7. I mean, beloved, where does the list start? Benny Hens and T.B. Joshua's and Rama Church and Angus Bucken and the Bushiris and the Shembis and the Lechenyanis and the Modisas. 
they all talk miracles and none of them can prove it. And if you needed any final evidence, we have the last two years of COVID. And everyone says, we didn't see this coming. Well, why didn't you see it coming, Mr. Prophet? And why did you tell the rest of us that it was coming? And when it came, where's your healings? To date, as of this morning, I've not heard of one verifiable healing of COVID by a miracle worker, gifted healer in any church on the planet. I'd love to be informed. Liars, all of them, who claim these pseudo-apostolic gifts. You know them by their fruits. Study their fruits. Prophecies that don't come true, we've talked about this back in Deuteronomy 18. Another bad fruit, a mark of their conduct, using lies to advance themselves. Remember in the New Testament, claiming the day of the Lord has already come, claiming the future resurrection has already happened. Another mark is they, that Joel James talks about targeting the unstable, the worldly, right? Enticing unstable souls, Second Peter says. Second Timothy talks about them captivating weak women, just like spiritual predators love to do. A sixth and a final description of their bad fruit in their conduct is ruling on their own authority rather than the Bible's, as we see in Jeremiah 23 and many places. So glad that our youth on Friday nights and young adults are studying 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2 and the whole book of Jude are all about examining these bitter fruits and bad and destructive results of these false teachers. Joel James also sums up their, not only their conduct, but their character. He says, here's three of the plumpest bad fruits of their character as false teachers. He says, they're liars. They follow sensual desires, especially with regard to sex and money. And they're arrogant power seekers. Well, look at the outcome, verse 19. Look at the text. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Like Jesus cursing the barren fig tree, like John the Baptist we saw earlier in Matthew, telling the religious leaders, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee the wrath to come, bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. The ax is already laid at the fruit of the trees. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. God will not turn a blind eye on empty boasts and barren lives. Eternal destruction, hellfire awaits every false prophet, every fake Christian boasting of big things but harming people and damaging eternal souls and producing bitter fruits. Oh, they might escape human judgment. They might fool people. They may deceive many on earth, but heaven is never fooled and they will answer in the end, right? Warning against wolves. They're deceptive, they're destructive. Watching for fruit. Two keys to avoid Deception to stay on the straight and narrow. How we praise God, don't we? For many of the unknown names in ordinary churches, faithful pastors, I think of Pastor Ron and others in my life, godly parents, Christian books, and as well as the known leaders, the MacArthur's, the Sproul's, and others, just in the last 50 years that have unceasingly warned us against error, scouted the wolves, spotted the bad fruits, been proven right time after time after time because they are biblical and we all should have known if only we had seen it. Whether it's defending the inerrancy of scripture decades ago, the lordship of Christ, warning against the charismatic movement, no matter how much flack and unpopularity that brought, warning against the seeker-friendly church growth pragmatic movement, warning against the emergent church group movement which came and went, now cautioning us against the social justice and the uh, critical race theory poison that is damaging the church and dividing the church and the Bodhi Balcoms alerting us to the fault lines that we are seeing more and more. Praise God for these leaders that defend biblical creationism. Biblical complementarianism in gender roles. Warn us about the LGBTQ invasion of Christianity. Confront the lies of psychology and feminism and secular humanism. Most recently warn about statism and capitulation to Caesar and how the physical gathering of the church is essential. Too often, have you noticed, it's so backwards. It's, it's grievous to watch. When someone godly sounds the alarm, it's like you're in your house 
and you discover a fire in the kitchen, but you and your guests don't like the noise, and you can see the animals hate the noise of the alarm, and so instead of going to put the fire out, you kill the alarm. Hey, stop it. Take out the batteries. Get rid of that crazy thing. I don't like the noise. Really? How about putting out the fire? How about listening to the warning? Instead of false accusation. Final lesson for us here, beloved. As Christians, as parents, as spiritual leaders for whoever is under your care or will be one day, ideas have consequences. Good ideas produce godly fruit. Bad ideas produce ungodly fruits. Don't be deceived. Don't fool yourself. Belief drives behavior. That's why Christian education is so vital for our young people and in the church. Christian parents and church leaders fail to study and identify the most deadly beliefs and dangerous ideas and competing worldviews of our day, then we won't be able to warn. Then we will be caught and vulnerable and duped by lies. If we don't refute bad doctrine and theological error and worldly philosophy and unbiblical thinking and false teaching, if we tolerate those lies, then inevitably the fruit will come back to haunt us, sometimes to our grave or for generations to come. The chickens will come home to roost. Ideas have consequences. Biblical discernment is not optional for the church. It is compulsory. You will know them by their fruits. And I end on a more positive note. After a heavy passage of warning against error from our Lord, let's remember, as one of my favorite poems puts it, truth never dies. The ages come and go, the mountains wear away, the stars retire, destruction lays earth's mighty cities low, and empires, states, and dynasties expire. But caught and handed onward by the wise, truth never dies. Though unreceived and scoffed at through the years, though made the butt of ridicule and jest, though held aloft for mockery and jeers, denied by those of transient power possessed, insulted by the insolence of lies, truth never dies. It answers not. It does not take offense, but with a mighty silence bides its time as some great cliff that braves the elements and lifts through all the storms its head sublime. It ever stands, uplifted by the wise, and never dies. As rests the sphinx amid Egyptian sands, as looms on high the snowy peak and crest, as firm and patient as Gibraltar stands, so truth, unwearied, waits the era blessed when men shall turn to it with great surprise. Truth never dies. Let's pray. Father, you have called us, the church, to be the pillar and support of the truth, the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Savior for sinners. We pray for any who are lost here today, as we once were. Only by your grace do we know anything of your truth, anything of sound doctrine and healthy churches. Thank you for your undeserved mercy in our lives, and may we go and humbly and boldly and courageously and clearly proclaim it and defend it to others in a world of lies where the wolves have had a heyday and seem to know no respite and no ceasing, where the roaring lion Satan himself is behind it all. Teach us to be sober. Make us more alert. May we adorn sound doctrine with our lives, O oh Lord, in our homes, in our church, in our relationships. May we display the power of your truth, the presence of Christ in all things, even now as we celebrate with our dear sister Kayla and your saving power, your truth in her life, rescuing her from lies and setting her free by your truth. We rejoice that how your truth is at work in this world. In Christ's true and saving name we pray. Amen. Amen.